Welcome to the NTEB Radio Bible Study with your host and Bible teacher, Jeffrey Greider. Rightly divided, dispensationally correct, and standing on the authority of the King James Holy Bible. This program is brought to you by NowTheEndBegins.com. And good evening, everybody. Happy Sunday night, and welcome to this edition of Rightly Dividing. My name is Jeff Greider. I'm the editor-in-chief of NowTheEndBegins.com, and tonight... For the next two hours, I have the honor and the privilege of being your radio host and Bible teacher. Tonight's topic, comic books and Hollywood have been preparing you for the return of the gods in the soon coming days of Noah. Have you ever wondered about the creation of the first comic book hero, Superman? Superman was the first of the comic superheroes created by two Jews writer Jerry Siegel and artist Joe Schuster. Everyone in Superman's family has Hebrew names like Kal-El and Jor-El. The comparisons between Superman in the comics and the Superman, Yeshua HaMashiach, are immediate and obvious, and we don't need to spend much time on that. But suffice to say, everywhere you look, from Superman, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, to Game of Thrones... You are being prepared for the real thing to come on the scene any day now. And as always, your dusty old and archaic King James Bible is way ahead of everybody else. The Bible says when the gods come down, they come down in the likeness of men, like Superman, Thor, the Incredible Hulk. Are you awake yet? Acts 14, verses 11 and 12. And when the people saw what Paul had done, lifted up the, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Ly- Lycaonia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. On this episode of Rightly Dividing, we are looking in the Bible tonight for the gods, little g gods, and they are all over the place. Not only that, Jesus makes a direct reference to their return in Matthew chapter 24, which will take place during the time of Jacob's trouble. You know, Eve was told that if she ate the forbidden fruit, she would become like the gods. Well, she ate it, and she sure did. And we've been paying the price for that horrible decision ever since. Since World War II, humanity was prepared through music, movies, and television to accept UFOs. And in 2019, the U.S. government acknowledged their existence. Since the launch of the Messianic-inspired Superman in 1938, and with every new superhero to arise ever since, people are being prepared to receive the gods. On this edition of Rightly Dividing, we lift the lid on all of it so you can properly discern the times in which you live and prepare yourself for the time that's coming. Also, tonight we will be observing the ordinance of communion with the Lord's Supper at the end of our Bible study. So make sure that you have your matzahs and grape juice handy. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, God, for all these that you've gathered here tonight, Lord, to study your word, uh, to remember your great sacrifice, uh, to gather around the table together, to lift each other up. God, we're, we're so glad, so grateful, and we're looking forward to that day when you'll come and get us and get us out of here. And we commit this time to you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about the gods, and we're going to talk about the gods tonight. Um, When you look in your Old Testament, New Testament, they're all over the place. Sometimes the gods, it's a good reference, and I'll explain that later. But most of the time, when you see the reference to the gods, like in Genesis chapter 3, it's a highly negative reference. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, just turn there for a moment. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Genesis 3, 1 through 5. 
Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. In our Nuggets from Genesis series, uh, we had that Bible study about two weeks ago talking about all the different types of trees in the Bible. And you saw very, very clearly that the Bible talks about the vine tree. And it's highly likely that the fruit that Eve ate off the tree was the fruit of the vine tree. And it's highly likely when you consider um, the vow of a Nazarite uh, had to abstain from drinking wine or eating grapes. Grapes are the only fruit in the entire Bible that some people were forbidden to partake of. So in Genesis 3, 3, but the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, that's, that's more than likely, it's a red grape vine tree. And the serpent said unto the woman in verse 4, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So, when Satan was tempting Eve with the forbidden fruit, he said to her, If you partake of that fruit, your eyes are going to be open, and you will be like the gods. You will be like one of us. And Eve ate that fruit and she became a little god. And then she suffered a little death. And for the last 6,000 years, humanity has been born in the image of Adam and in the image of Eve. And we're going to talk tonight about different Bible doctrines that people teach. We're going to, obviously, we're going to talk about the Word of Faith, Little God's Doctrine. We're going to expose that as the false teaching that it is, but it's a false teaching that's believed by a whole lot of people. And uh, we're going to show you that um, if you are a little God, you're not saved and you're headed for hell. You know why in John 3.3, 3, Jesus is talking to Nic Nicodemus and he says this, in John 3.3, 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If you were made in God's image, and I want you to think about this now, if you were made in God's image, why would you need to be born again? We're going to answer that when we come back, but I want you to think about that. If you were made in God's image, then why would you have to be born again? Glad that you're here tonight. It's time for us to face the fact that for decades we've ruined our name. Just look around us, 
It's easy to see that we share the blame. It's on you. of us are hurting, but we have all been called to carry the message to this human race. Our message is love. Our anthem is grace. It's time we remembered who we are. This is the church. Amen, amen, and welcome to church tonight. Right before the break, uh, I said, um, if you were born in the image of God, why would you need to be born again? The answer is found in Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, Genesis 5, 3. And Adam lived in 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. The reason why you have to be born again is because when you were physically born, you were born in the image of Adam and Eve after they were cursed by God and after they ate the fruit of the vine tree, after they listened to the word of Satan over the word of God. And when you came out of your mother's womb, Unfortunately, spiritually, you were born in the image of Adam. You were not born in the image of God. Now, go to Galatians chapter 3, and I'll show you from the Apostle Paul that that is 100% true. Galatians chapter 3. Um, let's read, um, well, verse 26. Galatians 3.26, Paul says, For ye are all the children of God. How? By birth? No. By faith in Christ Jesus. So the Apostle Paul says that if you are not born again by faith in Jesus Christ, you are not the child of God. You're not in the image of God. 
You're in the image of Adam and Eve after they sinned. And so when you put all these verses together, the reason why you and I had to be born again is we had to get rid of that, that, that image of Adam. The Bible says that Adam was the first man. He's of the earth. He's earthy. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. But Jesus Christ is the last Adam. You know, uh, there's a movie out now called Black Adam. And I haven't really investigated too much about it, but I think we could very easily put that movie into the category of what we're going to be talking about tonight. And um, you're going to see how strange it is that all of these superheroes have powers, kind of just like people who are mentioned in the Bible. Superman comes from the planet Krypton that lives under a red sun, a blood red sun. You know, the Bible says uh, that Jesus Christ is the son of righteousness. Malachi 4.2, but unto you that fear my name shall the capital S son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And uh, it is no coincidence that Superman comes from the planet Krypton, where he lived under a red sun, and Jesus Christ is the son of righteousness, blood red son of righteousness. We're going to be getting started with our Bible study in just a few minutes. And if you're just tuning in, we're going to be looking at how um, the last 80 years of comic books and movies and television and radio dramas have prepared you to receive the gods. Are you ready for what comes next? Crossing the calm sea with Jesus The disciples were getting concerned The wind started violently blowing But he was asleep in the stern Does he not care that we perish? We're helpless and we're so afraid Jesus arose when they called him And said to them, where is your faith? Because you prayed all night Because you held on with all of your might Child, your cries have awoken the master Your life had begun Seeing no hope in the distance You're frightened and nowhere to run By now your vessel is filling And you're thinking that you'll surely drown You've cried out for help from the Savior And you know you can't give up now because you prayed all night because you held on with all your might child your cries have awoken the master oh he knows your voice lift your hands Have awoken the master. 
he's fast asleep The winds are so deadly The water's so deep But try to be patient Cause soon he'll bring peace Just one word from his voice And it all must see One of my favorite, favorite songs, Beulah Land. Enjoy. I'm kind of homesick for a country to which I've Oh! 
Bible says in Isaiah chapter 14, starting in verse 12, Isaiah 14, 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. The devil has a throne. Have you ever wondered where it is? I know where it is. He says, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And when the devil is thrown into the lake of fire, this is what people will say to him. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake nations? Now, why on earth would they be talking to Satan like a man? Is this the man? Well, Psalm 82 verses 6 through 8, and I don't want to get ahead of my message tonight, but Psalm 82, verses 6 through 8, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. You know how the gods die? You know how the fallen angels and the Nephilim and the Rephium, you know how Satan is going to die? The Bible says he's going to die like a man, like a human being. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. One more song and we'll get started. One of my favorites of the new crop, The Last Blood. Thank you for the blood, Lord. John MacArthur doesn't appreciate it, but we sure do. Thank you for the blood that saved my soul. When men sinned in the garden, that sin Jehovah could not condone. The blood shed of Amen. Amen. For the sun is coming home. That's him. And then <laughs> Amen, Lord. And he's got the blood. Thank you for the blood. That he shed on Amen. Amen, Lord. Amen. This is the last blood I'll ever need. And there he comes. And he's got the blood that he shed on Calvary. And the Father says, well done, my son. This is 
Amen. Lord, thank you for the blood. Thank you, Lord, for making the payment that I could not pay. Lord, we come before you tonight, and uh, Lord, we pray for Anetta for continued healing from the stroke that she had two months ago. We thank you, Lord, that she could stand on her own for the first time last week, and we continue to lift her up for a complete healing, Lord. We pray for Clayton Perry tonight is receiving ongoing cancer treatments, and um, I don't know, he... uh, He really, really needs our prayers. Um, He used to sit behind me in church a number of years ago before the pandemic, and he came down with cancer about two years ago. And uh, please keep Clayton Perry in your prayers. Um, Dana Bragdon, she's had a bruise on her stomach after falling off her bike, and um, the doctor is doing tests to see if she has internal bleeding, but keep Dana Bragdon in your prayers, please, and we're believing God for a complete healing for her. Patty's husband, Jerry, he got his last radiation treatment on last Monday. Uh, Please pray that that will bear fruit for him. Steve and Amanda Lutz. Steve is one of my street preachers. And uh, him and his wife got COVID last week. She did okay. He wound up in the hospital. He came home the other day, uh, but he still has symptoms. But he says he feels better. He doesn't feel good, but he feels better. And thank God that he's not in the hospital. So please keep Steve Lutz in your prayers. Uh, Lori's mom, Joyce, has an unspoken prayer request. Cassie and Nick, they both have COVID and they need our prayers. Cassie is pregnant and she's having trouble with her lungs and has fatigue. Uh, Cheryl would like prayers for her late son Brian's uh, war buddy, Mike Dunn, who has a severe head injury from a bomb that exploded exploded near him on the battlefield in Ukraine. He's alive, but he's in bad shape. Please pray for Mike Dunn. Laura Compoy, she was involved in a motor scooter accident, has left her with many broken bones and months of rehabilitation. Uh, Please pray for Laura for a full recovery from her accident. Uh, Kevin Thompson and his wife are looking to move to a more affordable rent. Uh, They're also praying for an opportunity to move south, and they appreciate your prayers. Pastor John Ree and his wife April would like prayers for their baby daughter who is sick and currently in the hospital. Amen. Uh, Trisha's daughter Elena had a uh, miscarriage and she's asking for prayers for healing and for comfort. And it just happened the other day. Um, so please keep Elena and her husband in your prayers. Going through a miscarriage is a very emotional thing to go through and I've been through that and uh, it's it's just really really hard Uh, so please remember Trisha's daughter Elena in your prayers Uh, Jill says I've been quarantined for a week because of COVID and I can't just go run to the store so when you said that you were having communion tonight I got really excited that I still had a small cluster of grapes that I could squeeze for juice. I've never done that. And she says that she's so happy. She's so happy to assemble together in the word with her NTEB family and partake of communion and prayer. Amen. Uh, Jeanette would like prayers for a reliable caregiver, also for physical therapies at home. And she also has an unspoken that she says, God knows the situation. And she says, thank you, everybody, for praying. Uh, Kentucky Jeffrey says, please pray for me tonight. My new employer um, thinks highly of me, maybe a little too highly, and has put me into a position within the company that has more responsibilities than what I originally applied for. And he says, I feel immense pressure on me to perform this job, so much so that I cried about it on my way to preach at the Red Sox game. 
Thank you and all my family there for praying for me. God bless you all. Amen. Amen. And please pray uh, for Kentucky Jeffrey that God would give him leading and guidance and um, confirmation that he's in the right place at the right job. And uh, if the job calls for more than he can do, well, then God will just have to make up the difference because that's what God does. Um, When God's called you to do something, it may be over your head at the start, but uh, if God has called you to do it, God will provide everything you need to do that job. Uh, Praise report. The Matthias family has an update on Preston. They think that he has Crohn's disease, not cancer. Amen. Uh, And they are very thankful to all the prayers and support from their NTEB family. Regina says, prayer request, salvation for three sons and a granddaughter. Praise report. People are interested in certain things and am answering their questions. Hoping all will lead to salvation. Amen, Regina. Uh, Alan says, please pray for Trina Harvey. She suffered a stroke on Friday. She's in the hospital in Plano, Texas. Your prayers are so very welcome. Uh, Trina Harvey suffered a stroke just three days ago. Please keep her in your prayers. Aunt Nancy, please pray for my niece's two little boys, eight and three. They both have a fever of 102.4 and will miss the first day of school. Thank you so much. Uh, Shannon says, please pray for me and the entire NTEB team for continued strength and boldness. Amen. She says, thank you, Lord, for the blessings. Uh, Donna says, prayers uh, needed for an unspoken situation. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you. We praise you. We ask you to do for us, Lord, that that we cannot do for ourselves. And uh, Lord, we ask you to heal. We ask you to restore. We ask you to reconcile, uh, take burdens off of people, Lord. Give them strength and comfort and conviction and courage. And uh, Lord, we just, all these prayers and the unspoken prayers of our hearts, we just ask you to do something, Lord. And um, if you don't do it, it won't get done, but you will do it, Lord. Uh, The Bible says, faithful is he that will do it. And uh, we just thank you, God, and we praise you because you you do what you say that you're going to do. And we count on that, Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we have a nice full chat room tonight. Don't forget, at the end of the Bible study, somewhere around uh, 1040 Eastern Standard Time, we are going to uh, observe the ordinance of communion, the Lord's Supper. And um, if you don't have grape juice and a matzah, apple juice and a tortilla <laughs> will do just fine. But we'll be doing that around 1040 Eastern Standard Time. Now, with that, let's jump right into the Bible study. We got a lot to talk about tonight. Also, I want to remind you guys that at midnight tonight, we are going to be celebrating something that I think is pretty big. Uh, We are going to be celebrating 100 million visits. I want you to think about how many people that is. Uh, Tonight at midnight, we are going to be celebrating 100. Hundred million visits to now the end and uh, we are going to celebrate that with a 
massive, incredible sale in the bookstore. So if you've been waiting for the right time to buy a book or a t-shirt or an accessory or a kid's Bible or whatever, uh, starting at midnight tonight, we are celebrating 100 million visits to Now the End Begins with our biggest ever sale at the bookstore. And um, that's going to start at the stroke of midnight tonight, and it's going to last for 24 hours. And uh, we have 118 items on sale. And believe me when I tell you that the sale is the biggest, deepest sale that we've ever had, and we are celebrating uh, God's faithfulness in expanding this ministry. Uh, 100 million visits, it boggles my mind, and I praise the Lord for the increase. Absolutely praise the Lord for the increase, and I invite all of you to join us at midnight tonight. All right, with that, let's get started with tonight's Bible study. Let's get started with tonight's Bible study. In the book of Acts, turn to Acts chapter 14 and let's set the table. You hear me say that expression a lot, but I believe before you have dinner, you have to set the table. And setting the table when you're talking about something is a very important thing. And in Acts chapter 14, let's get the context um, let's start reading in verse eight. No, I don't. Verse seven, Acts 14, verse seven, and we're going to go down to verse 13. Uh, Acts 14, seven through 13. And there they preached the gospel. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leapt and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices. Paul did a miracle. They lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lycaonia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius, or Mercury, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before the city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people. So here you have... You have Paul and you have Barnabas, and they are preaching the gospel. It says in Acts 14, 7, uh, and there they preached the gospel. And so they're in uh, Lystra, they're in Derby. Verse 6 says that those places are cities of Lycaonia. And they start preaching the gospel, and then Paul, who has the apostolic signs, in verse 10, he says with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet, and he leaped and walked. What did Paul do? Well, he exercised the apostolic signs. What are the apostolic signs? Signs, miracles, and wonders. They are the same signs that the 144,000 witnesses are going to show. And they're the same signs from Mark chapter 16. Just turn to Mark 16 for a second. And in Mark chapter 16, in some of the modern Bibles, you don't have these passages that I'm about to read. You know, if, if you have a modern Bible... NIV, ESV, and if you're tired of how it takes out verses about the blood of Jesus Christ and how it puts mistakes into the Bible, like Revelation 13, 1, where it says that John is the dragon, um, 
if you're tired of having a Bible that is really more like a rubber sword than the sword of the Spirit, and you can't afford one, go to BibleBeliever.com and click on the link that says free, and we'll replace your NIV ESV Bible with the King James Bible. If you need one, but you can't afford one, go to BibleBeliever.com and click on the link for free, and we'll send you one. No strings attached, no gimmicks, a full-size Bible, uh, but we'll send you God's preserved word. In Mark chapter 16, starting in verse 15, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, Paul did that. If they drink any deadly thing, it will not harm them. They shall lay hands on the sick, Paul did that. And they shall recover. So here in Acts chapter 14, Paul has the apostolic signs. And he heals the man. Now, when the people at Lystra and Derby saw what Paul had done. They said in verse 11, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. You know, the people who lived in this time period, they were used to seeing things like the gods coming down. Turn to Acts chapter 19. Let's look at verse 35. Turn to Acts 19, and let's look down in verse 35. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana, and of the image which fell down from Jupiter. So when you read the Bible, and especially the Old Testament, but absolutely um, the kingdom age, in the first part of the New Testament, and you can clearly see how the people were used to talking about the gods. Now, when we think about that from a, 21st century perspective, we kind of chuckle a little bit and we think about the gods and we know that, well, that can't be true. (laughs) But turn to Matthew chapter 24, turn to Matthew chapter 24, and uh, let's take a look at what Jesus says is going to be a hallmark of of the time of Jacob's trouble, specifically the Great Tribulation. Matthew twenty four thirty six, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, What were the days of Noah? We've talked about this many, many times. Turn to Genesis chapter 6. Turn to Genesis chapter 6. And it came to pass, verse 1, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God, there they are, the gods, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Almost sounds like that was a good thing. Until you get to verse 5, Genesis 6, 5. 
And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Now turn to the book of Jude. Turn to the book of Jude. Let's look at verse 6. Jude 1, 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. That's Genesis 6 are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So, when we look in the Bible, we see the sons of God, and they're also referred to as the gods. The first place in your King James Bible that that term appears is Exodus 12.12. Exodus 12:12 12, 12 says, "For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord." Exodus 15. Turn to Exodus 15 verse 11. "Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods?" Who is like unto thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. So, all through the Bible, we see a group of entities that the Bible calls the gods. In some cases, it's a positive reference. In some cases, the sons of God it's a good thing, but in, I would say, the majority of the cases, it's a bad thing. And I read that verse, um, Jude 1, 6, to show you that Lucifer, when he falls, he takes about a third of the angels with him. Um, so when you are trying to figure out who the gods are, the gods are the host of heaven. That's who the gods are. Now, let me give you a positive reference. And you're going to like this one because this is one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. And it's a positive reference to the sons of God and to the gods. 1 John chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not beloved. Now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, we see that when we became born again, we are now figured as the sons of God, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, and, of course, that's a very positive reference. But in the Bible, the vast majority of the times when you see the gods, it's not good. It's a bad reference. It's talking about uh, entities that have uh, rebelled against God, that have raised their fist to God by joining with Lucifer who became Satan. 
Let me give you a couple more verses on the gods. Uh, let's see here. Judges 10.14. Here's a scary one. Judge. Well, actually, let's start in verse 13. Judges 10, 13 and 14. Yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods. Wherefore, I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. Isn't that an interesting reference? Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. Turn to Revelation chapter 6. And let's see what the time of that tribulation looks like. Revelation 6, starting in verse 15. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, You know what that is? That's idol worship. They are talking to the rocks, they are talking to the mountains. And they, they are asking rocks and mountains to protect them from the wrath of the Lamb. That is idol worship. When you pray to the Virgin Mary, that is idol worship. When you pray to the saints, that is idol worship. Revelation 6.16 and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? The Bible says that in that time, Luke 21, Luke 21, verses 25 through 28. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. The Bible says in verse 26 that men's hearts will be failing them for fear, not for cholesterol, not for blockages, but for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. That verse that I gave you from the book of Judges, God says, let your idols deliver you. And that's exactly what's going to be taking place during this time period. They are going to call out to the mountains and to the rocks and say, hide us from the lamb. And those idols aren't going to say anything at all. And with that, we have to take our first break of the night. Uh, we have set the table, and when we come back, uh, we are going to dig right in to comic books, UFOs, Superman, Thor, the Game of Thrones, and what that has to do with the gods. We'll be right back. There'll be no sorrows there. No more burdens to bear And no more sickness And no more pain No more parting over there And forever I will be With the one
And we are back for hour two of our Bible study tonight on the gods. In the first half hour, we set the table and we showed you um, a lot of references to the gods. Now, I want to play this clip. And you'll recognize these voices. I want to play this clip from the Word of Faith movement. And you can see, and we'll talk about the comic books in just a minute, but I want you to see how the table has been set by the Christian church, the professing Christian church, for people to receive the gods. Take a listen to this. Do you know what else that's settled then tonight? This hue and cry and controversy that has been spawned by the devil to try and bring dissension within the body of Christ, that we are gods. I am a little god. Yes. Yes. I have his name. I'm one with him. I'm in covenant relation. I am a little god. Critics, you are anything that he is. Yes. Now, in verse 26 and verse 27, God now submits himself to this principle of everything producing after its own kind. And in verse 26 and 27, let's read it out loud. Ready? Read. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now that's interesting because if everything produces after its own kind, we now see God producing man. And if God now produces man, and everything produces after its own kind, if horses get together, they produce what? And if dogs get together, they produce what? If cats get together, they produce what? But if the Godhead gets together and say, let us make man, then what are they producing? They're producing gods. Now, i got to hit this thing real hard in the very beginning because I ain't got time to go through all this. But I'm going to say to you right now, you are gods, little g. You are gods because you came from God. And you are God. You're not just human. The only human part about you is this physical body that you live in. You know, why do people have such a fit about God calling his creation, his creation, his man, not his whole creation, but his man, little gods? If he's God, what's he going to call them but the God kind? I mean, if you as a human being have a baby, you call it a human kind. If, if cattle has another cattle, they call it cattle kind. So, I mean, what's God supposed to call us? Doesn't the Bible say we're created in his image? You know who you are? Turn to Psalm 82. This is going to blow your mind real good. Psalm 82, 1. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. That's you. He judgeth among the what? Now, would you please listen to me? This is talking about you. He's telling the gods. Who are the gods? You are. See, I never heard that. Let me ask you this. Hello, you Let's just stop Benny Hinn right there. He was referencing Psalm 82, verse 1. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. You know, when Satan was tempting Eve with the fruit of the vine, he said to Eve, if you eat that fruit, you're going to be like the gods. And she ate the fruit, and she became like the gods, and she became lost. She died spiritually. Benny Hinn just told his entire congregation that they are the gods. 
How evil is that? You know, people get mad at me when I explain all the false teachings of the Word of Faith movement. People get mad at me when I explain the false teachings of people like John MacArthur. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at them for deceiving you. Are you God's offspring? Then you're not human. Do you see what I'm talking about? You say, Benny, am I a little God? You're a son of God, aren't you? You're a child of God, aren't you? You're a daughter of God, aren't you? What, what else are you? Quit your nonsense. What else are you? If you say, I am, you're saying, I'm a part of him, right? Is he God? Are you his offspring? Are you his children? You can't be human. How is it possible that Benny Hinn was was able to raise hundreds of millions of dollars with teaching like that? It is mind-boggling that that man could get 10 people to listen to him, much less getting millions of people to listen to him. This is some of the worst Bible teaching that I have ever heard in my life. And these people have congregations with tens of thousands of people in the congregation. This is how lost the church is in these last days. Kenneth Hagin states, quote, Man was created on terms of equality with God, and he could stand in God's presence without any consciousness of inferiority. God has made us as much like himself as possible. He made us the same class of being that he is himself, unquote. All right, that's about all that I can take of that, but I wanted to play that clip for you just to show you that there is a whole section of Christianity that teaches that you're a little God. And I think you're starting to see from all the references that I've been giving you that to be one of the gods is not necessarily a good thing. In 1 John chapter 3, to be a son of God after you become born again, that's a great thing. But Benny Hinn trying to pin Psalm 82 verse 1 on you God standeth in the congregation of the mighty, he judgeth among the gods. Well, if Benny Hinn would have kept reading, he would have got down to verse 5. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and ye and all of you are the children of the Most High. But... Ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. It is a bad thing to be among the gods. And so I just wanted to play a little bit of the the very false teaching of the Word of Faith movement. Um, All right, let's talk about some comic book superheroes. I have an article in front of me here. And the headline is, The Jewish Origins of Our Comic Book Superheroes. March 8, 2016, Oakland University Religious Studies and Center for Religious Understanding. The article says this, Superman, Batman, Captain America, Spider-Man, The Hulk, The Fantastic Four, The Avengers, and the original X-Men all have two things in common. They are all superheroes, and they were all created by Jews. The preeminent creators in a comic book history are all Jewish men. Jerry Siegel and Joel Shuster, they created Superman. Bob Kane and Bill Finger created Batman. Will Eisner created the Spirit. Joe Kubert created Sergeant Rock. 
Jack Kirby and Joe Simon created Captain America. Stan Lee and Jack Kirby created the Hulk, Fantastic Four, Avengers, X-Men, and many more. So now what parallel am I drawing between the fact that the vast majority of the most famous superheroes were created by Jewish people, specifically Superman, who comes from the planet Krypton, and his real name is Kal-El, and his father's name is Jor-El. Uh, the dash E-L on the end of their name is a reference to God, Elohim, El Shaddai. And so when you realize that since 1938, on radio programs, in the movies, in comic books, on television, in the theaters, from Hollywood, have you ever stopped to consider how popular the superhero franchise has become. I mean, it's really escalated to a, a whole new level. When I was a kid, I used to watch the uh, black and white Superman show on TV. I really enjoyed watching that. I enjoyed watching um, the very campy Batman and Robin uh, when I was 10. And, you know, I've, I was a fan of Superman and Batman, but in the 21st century, the popularity of these superheroes has reached epic levels, and these movies have become billion-dollar movies, and people wait for hours before the opening, sometimes days before the movie opens, and there is this huge fascination with superheroes that have superpowers, that have magic powers. And of course, when we read the Bible, we see this same type of thing happening with the gods. Jesus says that the time of Jacob's trouble, specifically the tribulation, is going to be like the days of Noah. Well, can you imagine what it must have been like for fallen angels to come down and to fornicate with human women and God allowed an offspring to come from that and it produced giants that were 12, 13 feet high. Can you imagine what that must have looked like? And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6 that, that everywhere that God looked, there was wickedness. And that wickedness came from the fallen angels and their children, the Nephilim. Genesis 6, 5 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so God sent the flood, and he wiped out the vast majority of these beings. He wiped out the giants that were a human hybrid. But he didn't wipe out the fallen angels. He didn't wipe out Satan. Now turn to Job chapter 41. Turn to Job chapter 41. And I'm going to show you why Satan is pictured as Leviathan. Leviathan is a water horse is what he is. And you're not going to drown out Leviathan in any flood. And so the giants died because they had human blood. But the fallen angels didn't die. And Satan certainly did not die in the flood. 
You know, uh, the Bible pictures him as a serpent. And we have a tendency to think of a serpent as a tiny little snake. But that's not how the Bible pictures him. Job chapter 41. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? Or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put an hook into his nose? Or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not be uh, one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that he dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. His scales are his pride. Shut up together as with a close seal. Upon earth there is not his like, who is made without fear. And when you read those verses in Isaiah chapter 14, you see a creature that has no fear. And he makes five separate threats to God. Lucifer, Satan, is not afraid of God. He has no fear of any kind. And in Job chapter 41, we see uh, in, in verse 31, He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. He maketh a path to shine after him. One would think that the deep to be hoary. Upon earth there is not his like who is made without fear. Do you see why the flood didn't drown out Satan? It didn't drown him out because he is, his, he is a sea-swimming reptile. That's what Satan is. He is a sea-swimming reptile. So I want you to think about what are the most popular movies these days. Well... The Marvel movies, Black Panther, X-Men, Batman, Superman. How about when you go to uh, Home Box Office, Game of Thrones? What's more popular than Game of Thrones? But what is Game of Thrones about? It's about Norse mythology. It's about Thor and Odin. And so we live in a world that is absolutely obsessed with the gods. And they make movie after movie after movie. And what are those movies doing? They are getting you to accept the gods coming down in the likeness of men. So we see Captain America, who is a man. But he has superhuman powers. We see Superman, who is a man, but he has superhuman powers. And down the list that it goes, you watch the X-Men. And they're all men and women that have superpowers. And all the kids watch the movies and, boy, isn't that cool. And you begin to imagine what would it be like if you, were, if you could fly like Superman. If you were as clever as Batman, um, if you could do what Spider-Man does, or if you could run as fast as the Flash, or swim like Aquaman. And so, for decades, Hollywood has been programming and re Wonder Woman, that's right, with her invisible plane and her golden lasso. And that movie uh, with Gal Gadot came out a couple of years ago. And it was a blockbuster. And all the women are watching this movie and seeing how beautiful she is. And seeing how strong she is. And imagining what it would be like if they were like Wonder Woman. And so what we see has been absolute mental conditioning since 1938 to get you to accept superheroes. 
They are part of our everyday life. When they make these movies, these movies generate billions, billions of dollars. And a huge section of the people going to these movies are Christians. And as you can see from all the Bible verses that I've been giving you, when you have superheroes with superpowers, Superman comes from outer space, Lucifer comes from outer space, Antichrist comes from outer space, Jesus Christ comes from outer space at the second coming. And so, because we are so close to that time right now, that everybody is being mentally prepared to receive visitors from outer space. And that's why when they make these movies, these movies are incredibly popular. Because people like that. They want to meet those entities. And we are right around the corner from the day when those entities are going to make an appearance. A lot of the times people will criticize me because I say that, in my opinion, I believe that it is possible that some of those things could show up before we get out of here in the rapture. I don't teach that as doctrine. That's just my opinion. But I think that it's highly likely that we are going to get a little taste of the visitors before we get out of here in the rapture. Because we are so close to that. And so it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing to support these movies and go to these movies when you consider the spiritual ramifications of what these movies are teaching. Now, uh, I said at the start of this hour that the vast majority of the writers and artists of these superheroes are Jewish people, the significance of that statement, it says that to the Jews were delivered the oracles of God. To the Jewish people, were delivered the oracles of God. Romans 3, 2, the Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. And what are the oracles of God? The Old Testament and the New Testament. Genesis to Revelation. Every single one of the authors of all 66 books were all Jews. Now, if the Jews received the oracles of God, does it not also make sense that in the last days you're going to see Jewish people at the forefront? And so when you understand that some of the most popular superheroes ever created, Captain America, Superman, Spider-Man, X-Men, the Hulk, they were all created by Jewish people. Why is that important? And I don't say that in any sort of derogatory way at all. I'm just simply saying that the time of Jacob's trouble is going to put the Jew in the spotlight. We're going to get out of here in the rapture. 
and the Jews are going to take center stage. And for seven years, the Bible says the time of Jacob's trouble is going to unfold. So the Jews are getting ready to step up to the plate. They're getting ready to be judged. We're getting ready to get out of here. So you put it all together. Jesus says that the great tribulation is going to be like the days of Noah. The days of Noah, the fallen angels, the Nephilim, the giants, the gods. The oracles were committed unto the Jews. The Jews are creating all the really popular superheroes that are an uh, illustrated depiction of the gods. Because the gods are getting ready to come back and the Jews are getting ready to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. It really makes perfect sense. So when you see these things and you see them promoting the Marvel Cinematic Universe, they call it the MCU, and it's cutting edge and it's hip and it's popular... And everybody wants to go support these movies. And just for two and a half hours at a time, just stare at the screen of these superheroes with the superpowers. And let me tell you something. If one of those superheroes was to walk out of the screen and into the lobby, they would be hailed as a hero. They would be worshipped. And that's exactly what's going to take place during the time of Jacob's trouble. And that's why we see uh, that the superhero franchise has gone to a multi-billion dollar business. Because the real things are right around the corner and they're getting ready to show up. We'll be right back after this. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine. What my eyes will see when your face is before me, I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, one with my heart. 
can only imagine when all I would do is forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine. Amen, amen. And we are back for the last half hour of tonight's Bible study. And um, I hope it's just a simple study tonight, looking at the gods in the Bible, looking at how they have been um, wrongly portrayed with some preachers telling you that you are the gods and you are little gods. Uh, Let me assure you that um, you are not little gods. God didn't make a little God. God made a man. God didn't make a little God, and he didn't make a little goddess. He made a man. He made a human being. And human beings are not little gods. That is a wrong teaching. That is a false teaching. And that should be rejected 100%. If you're a little God, you're not saved, you're not born again, and you're headed for hell, and uh, you need to get away from that stuff. Um, I got a letter the other day, and I I just want to share this letter with you guys, and I want to read it to you because it was really, um, uh, I was surprised to get this letter. I was very, very happy to get this letter. But I, I just want to read it to you and share it with you uh, because it's, it's, it's really exciting to me. Uh, it was from Sheriff Mascara from the St. Lucie County Jail. He wrote to me and he said, Dear Pastor Greider, I'm writing to thank you for all your time and support and to donating the 1500 King James Bibles and two cases of study Bibles to the individuals incarcerated in the St. Lucie County Jail. During this difficult time, your gift brings hope and encouragement. Your meaningful show of support is appreciated and makes a tangible difference in the lives of those incarcerated in the St. Lucie County Jail. Thank you again for your kindness, appreciation, and support. Ken J. Mascara, Sheriff of the St. Lucie County Jail. So I want to share that with you, and uh, I'm going to be taking a trip down there in a couple of weeks. But what the Lord has put on my heart, um, and I want all of you to pray for this, that God would give me wisdom to do it the right way, But we've had our free Bible and gospel track program for about three and a half years now. And um, during that time, we've given away boxes of Bibles to different jail ministries. We support a number of jail ministries. But when we got the call and the opportunity to give over 1,500 Bibles to the St. Lucie County Jail last week, Something changed, and that something is this. We are starting a new program called Bibles Behind Bars, and I wrote about it on Friday, but I just wanted to share a little bit of my my heart with you in this matter. Um, This is going to be separate from the Free Bible and Gospel Track program. And this is going to specifically concentrate on men and women who are incarcerated in jails and prisons around the country. And um, I want you guys to pray for this, but Bibles Behind Bars, uh, that is going to be a whole new outreach that we're going to have. Um, And uh, I believe God has opened up a door to really get something. And I want you to think about what that means. We're not just giving out Bibles. We're giving out King James Bibles. 
And God is giving us an open door. God is giving us an open door to put King James Bibles into the darkest places in America, jails and prisons. And so many of the people there have no hope at all. And we're going to be sending in King James Bibles. The Bible says where the word of a king is, there is power. So I want you to pray. Uh, Tricia says, I'm praying for a revival in this prison via these Bibles. Amen. And not only are we going to be handing out Bibles to prisons and jails, I think we need to have specific prayer times to pray for the places that we give these Bibles to and to really lift those places up so that when the Bibles get delivered, God's Spirit is already going to be working there. Dana Bragdon says, Ken Mascara knew my dad. My dad chaired criminal justice program at Palm Beach State College. Well, what a small world that is. So, as we go forward, and the Lord is giving us this brand new opportunity, and we're calling it Bibles Behind Bars, we're going to have a separate prayer time, and we're going to pray specifically for the jails and the prisons that we send these Bibles to. Dana Bragdon said that um, she reached out to us so that we could send some Bibles to the Martin County Jail, and we did that last week. Those Bibles have already gone out. So um, this is exciting that the Lord is expanding us. And when you think about when somebody, when a man or a woman winds up behind bars, how scary that must be. And that you and I can be part of the team that sends in King James Bibles to comfort those people. Can you imagine how many people might get saved and how many saved people might get right with God again? Because we're sending in King James Bibles to the jails and the prisons. So this is going to be an official separate thing from our free Bible and gospel track program. We're calling it Bibles Behind Bars. And um, I've already told the Lord that I am willing to go to the prisons and preach. And if they'll have me and if I can travel there, I'm going to go there and I'm going to preach to the inmates. Um, so please keep that in your prayers and if God puts it on your heart to donate, <laughs> costs a lot of money to do this. If God puts it on your heart to donate, please donate and be generous. Uh, because that's the only way that we can do this. I'm thinking thousands and thousands of Bibles for the Bibles Behind Bars program. And let's see what the Lord will do, and let's pray about it. Let's pray about it. Um, but I just wanted to share that with you, that that is an official new part of our ministry, separate from the Free Bible and Gospel Track program, which is really more of a general thing. Um, this is going to be specific to inmates in jails and prisons. So please keep that in your prayer, and please, if you can, support it, uh, because that's the only way that we can do it. Uh, all right, with that, let's turn to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and let's begin to calm our minds and... I want us to gather around the table tonight and I want us to think about the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 
Verse 23, Paul says, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. I want to play this song and I want to get our hearts and minds thinking about what Jesus did on the cross. Just take a few minutes and close your eyes, listen to the words of this song, and think about what Jesus was born to do for you. Oh, the call of a shepherd in a field nearby to tend and to carry his flocks by night. They were not ordinary sheep, they were set apart, born to be passed over lands. And when a spotless male was born, he was held on the manger floor, swaddled up just to keep him calm until his time. And the shepherd sang Wrap this one up He is a lamb Without blemish Wrap this one up He'll make his way To the temple Born for sacrifice He'll to the others And pay the price Wrap this one up Wrap the call of a mother in a town nearby to tend and to carry on this holy night not an ordinary child but the son of God breathed by the Holy Spirit and when the baby He was held on the manger floor As she swaddled him up She knew his time would come As she sang Wrap this one up He is the one That we adore Wrap this one up He'll wear Becoming the curse for us He gave 
his life For he knew that his time had come Wrap this one up, he is the lamb Without blemish Wrap this one up, he paid the price And it is finished But death would have no sting says in Isaiah 53, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your gift. We thank you, God, for coming down like a man, being born like a man, and living a perfect life, and then going to the cross at Calvary and making the payment for my sins, Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, says in verse 27, whosoever, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. The Apostle Paul is talking about the um, sanctity of, of this ordinance of observing the Lord's Supper, the soberness that is behind it and the seriousness that is behind it. And when we partake in the elements, when we drink the fruit of the grape and we eat the matzah, we're reminding ourselves of why these things were necessary in the first place. And they were necessary because we had sin that we can't pay for ourselves. And so the Apostle Paul says that when you get together as a church family, as the body of Christ, to observe the Lord's Supper, it has to be done with an introspective look And if there's something that you need to get right with the Lord, now is the time to do it. If there is something that you need to say to the Lord, some some special thing that you want the Lord to do for you, or something that you have to put under the blood, 
And whatever that is, that is personal, that is private. That's not for public display. That's just between you and the Lord. But let's take a moment now and pray and put it under the blood. Heavenly Father, we come before you as a church family, as your body, as the body of Christ, and we're we're overwhelmingly grateful tonight, Lord. And I thank you, God, that 31 years after getting saved, Lord, I, I still look at your sacrifice with tears in my eyes. And uh, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lord, that my sins caused you to go to the cross. And uh, Lord, I thank you for you making the payment And Father God, I pray that you give me strength against sin. You give me strength against the world, the flesh, and the devil. You let me set my face like a flint, Lord. And uh, to look at the things of your kingdom, the kingdom of God, and your gospel, the gospel of the grace of God. And uh, Lord, as your word says, let us um, lay aside these things that separate us from you. The Bible says in Hebrews, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who... For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Lord, we thank you for your unspeakable gift. Wash us, make us clean, set our feet on a rock, Lord. Um, Go before us, lead us, guide us, show the way. Lord, we thank you for the food on the table. We thank you for waking us up today. We thank you for the clothes on our back. We thank you for this church family, for this ministry, and how people all over the world right now are are praying together and worshiping together, Lord. And uh, Father God, we just we are reminded of your great sacrifice on the cross for our sins. And we commit this, Lord, this Lord's Supper to you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians 11.23, For I have received the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night, we're going to partake in the bread now, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. And I want you to think about that as you partake in the cup. Heavenly Father, thank you. Lord, I never imagined that a day would come where there would be online Bible studies and an online community of believers that you would use for your glory to get something done for you in these last days. I never imagined, Lord, that we would do communion online as a church family. We are all separate, yet we are all connected. We are all together. We're all 
lifting each other up to you, Lord. And I praise you for that, Father God. And Lord, I ask you to do something with this group, these tens of thousands of believers around the world connected through Now the End Begins. Use us, Father God, for your glory. Lord, let us send a million Bibles out. Whatever it is that you want, lead us and show us, Lord. Give us the resources. Give us the the leading, the guiding, the comfort, the encouragement. You lead, Lord, and give us the strength to follow. And uh, we'll give you all the honor and the glory for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I want to thank everybody for tuning into the Bible study tonight. I want to thank you for being part of this ordinance of the remembrance of his great sacrifice and his great love wherewith he loved us so that he could set us free. This group, this NTEB family, Uh, means more to me than any words I could ever use to express that. I love doing these programs and fellowshipping with you all. I love when you guys come to visit at the bookstore in the studio. I love when we have the camp meetings together. And I'm so excited to see what God is going to continue to do with us and through us for his glory and for our good and for the salvation of many. It's an exciting time to be alive. It's an exciting time to be saved and serving on the front lines of the end times. Don't forget at midnight tonight for 24 hours, we're going to be celebrating 100 million visits to Now the End Begins uh, with a massive sale at the bookstore, uh, 118 different things on sale. If you've been waiting for the perfect time to buy a book, now's the time. If you need a Bible and you can't afford one, please go to BibleBeliever.com, click on the link that says free, and we'll send you a King James Bible in English. We'll send you a King James Bible in Spanish, and... Um, There's no strings attached. You don't have to pay the shipping. We don't put you on a mailing list. Just go to BibleBeliever.com. If you need a Bible and you can't afford one, we'll send you one at no cost. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in tonight. Uh, Lord willing, we'll see you back here tomorrow, noon Eastern time, for the Prophecy News Podcast. Have a great night, everybody. And don't forget, at midnight, go to the sale.
mother said, why a king would want to leave his throne? to live and yet not fit to kill 